Welcome to the SB Grid YouTube channel. Software tutorials by developers, lectures by structural biologists, unique content brought to you by SB Grid. Again, welcome to the back to the SB Grid webinar series. Happy New Year. A uh, little bookkeeping stuff. Our next webinar is going to be February 13th, and that's Bjarne Forsberg, who's going to be talking about Occupy, which is a program to estimate local scaling for cryo EM maps. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation today, you can either use the QA feature at the bottom, or you can send questions to us in the chat, and we'll we'll moderate at the end. And today we have Graham Winter joining us from Diamond Light Source in the UK, and He's here to talk about dials and what's new with dials in general and with multi-crystal data sets in general. So with that, Graham, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us and for presenting today. Cool. Thank you for inviting me to give this web uh, webinar. So um, when it turned out, when, when I looked through the kind of what's new, it transpires that almost all of what's new is actually um, about the multi-crystal stuff. So actually, I think this is should be a fairly sort of coherent uh, view on what's going on. Um, I'm not sure whether everybody's got the full detail um, of how dials has generally been there. So I've got a little bit at the beginning talking about dials and the workflow as a whole, and then a bit more about um, how we handle multi-crystal data in dials. So um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that Dials has had funding from many sources over the years, um, and it's also based on uh, the work of a lot of other people who have published some really nice papers on how their methods work in programs like XGS and MOSFILM and so forth. And so the development we've made in Dials is very much uh, based on that, that sort of starting point. Um, I would also like to highlight the fact that a lot of different people have uh, committed to the dials repository in one way or another. So again, thank you to everybody who has worked on that. Okay, so in the general sense, uh, dials is a toolkit for doing diffraction data processing. So, um, you know, in the simplest sense of the word, the actual job of data processing is really quite straightforward. Uh, we find where the spots are, we draw little boxes around them and we work out how many counts go into each spot and we subtract an estimate of the background and then we correct for some experimental effects. And that's really the key thing that all we're doing with dials. Um, if you're handling multiple crystals, then the key thing is to, before you um, try and place them all on a common scale, you need to align them in reciprocal space. And so that's basically the only real gotcha between doing regular data processing and multi-crystal data processing. And this is really where I'm gonna focus most of the attention. Um, so if you're using dials, uh, many different facilities run dials through the medium of uh, Zia2. Um, Zia2 is something that's been around for 17 years now, I believe, and it's started off life being there to run MOSFILM and XDS. These days, it's more commonly used to run dials or um, XDS. It, so the idea with that is it's kind of a completely automated system and you give it the um, data that you want to process. You set it going and ignore it. Dials is, is slightly different. It's a toolkit. It's about in algorithms. It's about interactive use. And it's there to be used either uh, to do some interactive data processing because you're interested or because, um, you know, you may want to in incorporate it as a, a set of tools where you write your own data processing scripts or something like this. So, um, if you know, for the sake of completeness, if I'm mentioning the Zero 2 workflow, it is really quite straightforward. Uh, you... So Zia2, here are some data. You can pass more than one image equals. You can fast do some other stuff. And then you drink some coffee. And when you're finished, you look at the results. Um, the idea of Zia2 is it's supposed to be self-explanatory. So I don't really intend to talk much more about it. Um, but when we come to a bit later on, the relevance of Zia2 will come back. Okay, so if we're doing interactive data processing, then uh, the, there's always a fairly universal kind of workflow. Key thing we need to start off with is finding spots on all the images that we want to analyze. Then we have to figure out a set of vectors that describe where those spots are in a reciprocal space. Um, 
we then do maybe a bit of refinement on that, then use those vectors to calculate where every spot on the data set should be, go away, draw boxes around them, measure them, then figure out the symmetry and then try and correct some experimental effects. So this is the same whether you're using dials or HKL or um, XDS or whatever. Now, if you're going through the same workflow with dials, actually, we don't have a lot of imagination. So when we come up with the different program names that you're using for the various steps, these are pretty descriptive of what you're actually doing. So we start off by importing the data. We do some spot finding, uh, indexing, refinement, integration, and then determine the symmetry and scaling. So these are the steps you go through with any integration program, and we've just named them uh, that way. There's a few bits where you can go off off piece, so to speak, um, if you're doing multi-crystal work and so forth. But in the general sense, this is the flow that you go through. So if you are processing data with dials, uh, obviously the raw data you have will be CBF files or HDF5 files or TIFFs or MAR CCDs or ADXV, uh, ADSC images or whatever. Um, dials itself produces some intermediate files. These are either called REFL files which are big kind of meaningless blobs of uh, binary data that contain the reflection information. And then EXPT files that are kind of uh, in a text format that's sort of fairly human readable. And in the general case, most dials programs will consume one or two of, uh, one, one of each of these and produce one of each of these. So the normal flow is that experiments and reflections go in and experiments and reflections come out. And what we do is we do calculations to get from one step to the next. So um, we start off by importing the data and really all we're doing here is reading the metadata. So all the image header information, the wavelength, the beam centers and all this kind of thing and trying to make sense of the data that you've given dials. So um, if you've given it a single scan, it will look at it and it will tell you, yes, this looks like a single scan. If you've given it multiple runs, it will tell you, actually, I've found three runs, four runs, or whatever. Um, so when you're importing the data, it's firstly worth having a quick look at what it says in the output, in the text output on the screen, to make sure that that lines up with what you're expecting. Um, but I would also say this is one of the most error-prone steps, simply because if you import the wrong data or whatever, it won't obviously do what you're expecting. Um, and you do need to import the, for example, if you're doing IGIT data, you have to import the master file, not the data files. Um, so that's where things can um, go a bit wrong. Occasionally, uh, you'll find that when you import the data, it doesn't understand it, it doesn't make sense or whatever. Um, and this would be because the data that have been taken are from a facility we are not aware of over at Diamond. So uh, we have a load of, um, basically a library of what we call format classes that are used to interpret data from different synchrotrons. Um, and so what happens is we take the data that you provide to dials import and we match it against that library um, and we try and in interpret the data as it is. So for example, there's different ways that you can um, record the beam center on different beam lines. And sometimes if you're not following the sort of standard protocols that can go wrong and we would have to come up with a custom format class for that instrument. So. Um, generally, with Igers and Pilatuses, there's actually not too much in the way of variation, so it's not too problematic. Once you've done this, next thing you can do, if you like, is look at the images. So you just do this with dials.imageViewer. Um, this is very useful when you're first getting used to using dials, and also if you're on a beamline and trying to make sense of the data that you've got. Um, there's a bunch of different options in there, and the best way to learn about that is to play with it. Um, but one of the I would like to highlight is there's an option at the very bottom um, right of the control panel that allows you to look at the data through the same set of eyes that the spot finding uses. So this is the statistical methods that the spot finding works with. And this allows you to see which pixels it thinks are spots and which ones are background. So if you're working on something which is very experimental, like uh, electron diffraction or whatever, that can be very useful um, because you may be working with a completely alien instrument. Um, or if you're in the process of collecting data, you can use this to get an idea, a real idea of how well your crystals are diffracting by looking to see how far out it can find spots. So this is very useful. Um, occasionally, you'll need to actually mask the data. So on the left, I have an image taken on I-24 a few weeks back. 
where it transpires because we've got the detector quite close in you can see the shadow from the cryojet um, so if you are processing this data and there were likely to be spots out there you might want to mask that there's a tool in the image viewer for um, doing that what i would say is actually in most cases those spots will get rejected anyway because they are out there we outliers in the distribution um, and also actually most beamlines are pretty well set up so that you don't get um, shadows like that that you need to consider um, but if that's the case there are tools to help you there uh, i've actually only did, done this once or twice in the last year so it's pretty unusual um, once you've done the importing you maybe look at the images or don't look at the images entirely up to you the next thing we do is spot finding um, and with the spot finding what you're looking for is actually it goes through the entire data set and tries to find spots on every image and gives you this kind of very basic ASCII art graph at the very end. Um, and what this can give you is an idea of, you know, what happened to my crystal. If you've got a, the same, sort of roughly the same number of spots as you go through the data set, you know, you've got quite a few at the beginning, quite a few at the end, maybe it comes and goes in a sinusoidal manner, um, then your crystal has probably not suffered much damage during the experiment. If you have something which is a continuous downward trend, then you've probably uh, hit your crystal too hard with the x-rays and you've got significant radiation damage, as is shown in the bottom there. If you load up the uh, within the image viewer, the imported experiment and the strong reflection list, you can actually look at uh, both the pixels that were identified and the um, centers of mass and the shoe boxes and so forth in the image viewer as well. So it's quite, it can be quite useful for getting to grips with. And this is principally useful for making sure that you've got the right set of parameters, firstly for the data collection. And secondly, if you're processing dozens or hundreds of data sets, you want to get this right from the beginning. Um, so for example, if you're collecting data from many, many crystals, you want to make sure that you're not annihilating them all. You want to be collecting fairly sensibly so that you're trying to minimize the amount of trouble you'll have later on in the experiment. So the indexing, uh, as I said earlier, is really just trying to find a, bait, a set of vectors that will describe the uh, where the spots are in reciprocal space. This is the same on any other program. Um, we, ha we have a tool in the um, dials called the Reciprocal Lattice Viewer as well, which is very useful for um, looking and visualizing reciprocal space. So if, as you see here, we've indexed 99% of the reflections, we've probably only got one crystal. If you've indexed the 45 or 50 percent of the reflections you may actually have a complete second lattice and you'd see that very clearly in the um, reciprocal lattice view and it's worth playing with this because there's lots of different ways that you can reorientate it you can show the um, reciprocal cell and if you index the data you can show the spots in the crystal lattice frame rather than in the laboratory frame and that's very helpful for doing multi-crystal work Refinement, all we're trying to do basically is adjust things like the cell parameters and the crystal orientation to better match the spots that we observe on the images with where we calculate the spots to be. And this is just expressed in terms of uh, minimizing the RMS deviations. And as you can see here, the numbers in all three columns became measurably smaller. Integration is basically taking the output of the refinement, using that to calculate where the spots are and project them onto the detector and to go anywhere and do some measurement. After we've done that, we then need to look for symmetry in the diffraction patterns. So if we've taken a single scan, this is quite straightforward because we basically take every possible symmetry operation that uh, is, is compatible with the shape of the lattice that we have, and then apply each one and compute essentially a correlation coefficient. If those correlation coefficients are high, like 0.9 something, then that symmetry operation is probably present. If they are down, like down 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that symmetry operation is fairly likely to be absent. And then it takes that, that list of operations and composes that to figure out the correct space group. And this is surprisingly robust. Scaling is just trying to correct for the experimental effects. And all we're doing here is trying to adjust for the fact that the amount of crystal in the beam will vary. Maybe you'll have sample absorption. Maybe your crystal will be de decaying slightly as you go through the experiment and so forth. And this is exactly the same way with any other um, integration program. So HKL, MOSFILM, XDS, all of these programs do the same sorts of tasks. OK, so that means that essentially when I'm processing data with dials, for a single scan, I have what, I, what you could call a spell. 
essentially this is the i didn't bother reading the documentation i just run this script and it actually often works pretty well particularly if your crystal is fairly reasonable you haven't got catastrophic radiation damage and it's an instrument that we know so we know the beamline layout we know how the beam center is written and this kind of thing um so in general actually you can go quite a long way with processing any single data set with this what i call a spell so uh, the workflow I've just described is starting from the images, going through, importing, find spots, doing some indexing, uh, refinement, integration, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, if you're used to using HKL, uh, you may think, well, hang on a minute, after indexing, normally I pick the right lattice. And you can do exactly that with dials. You can, after the indexing step, run a program called Refine Brave Settings. And this will basically take the uh, data that you've indexed try mapping it to different symmetries so like tetragonal or cubic or whatever it, whatever it appears to be compatible with do some refinement and then print out the ones that appear to refine well and then you can pick one of those and go away and take it forward for the next steps in most cases it doesn't make a lot of difference so i don't normally talk about using it but those tools are there the other thing you can do is bring multiple um, data sets together at the symmetry step so if you've done a multi-sweep data set, then you can, you know, so you do something like the small molecules or a, a more than one orientation on a multi-axis goniometer and so forth. You can process the data separately up to the end of the integration step and then bring them together. Um, the important thing in doing that is that you um, use a consistent UB matrix for that step. So um, you can bring the data and process them together um, all the way through with something which I call ensemble processing that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, <clears throat> or in many cases, it will be unambiguous anyway. So if your crystal's orthorhombic, there's only one way of defining the orientation matrix. So it won't be a problem. But it can it can be an issue if you bring your data together at that stage there. Uh, we have tools in dials, though, to address exactly that problem, which is the main focus of this, today's presentation. So um, the scale together thing, here's some data I took a while back on I-24 at Diamond. So I've got two runs uh, from a cubic insulin crystal. Here's the first run. You can see the um, overall eye of a sigma is about 20 to the suggested resolution limit. The suggested eye of a sigma for the second run is also about 20. So when I put them together, the eye of a sigma should get higher. No, they got lower. And this is because this is cubic insulin and it transpires that actually one of the lattices was indexed differently to the other lattice. Um, so you have to make sure that these are internally consistent. And this is one of the tools that we developed over the last couple of years in dials is something we've called COSIM. And essentially the job of this is to <clears throat> resolve the crystal symmetry and indexing ambiguity simultaneously by aligning the lattices in reciprocal space. So um, one of the things that you may be familiar with if you are doing uh, multi-crystal data processing is that quite frequently you can only measure, say, five or ten degrees of data from each crystal. If you're in that situation, it's actually really hard to derive the correct symmetry from that um, crystal from that individual sweep because all you can do is index it and go well it kind of looks tetragonal-ish or it looks cubic-ish or it looks hexagonal but you really have no idea because you haven't got enough symmetry related reflections unfortunately to scale the data you need to know the correct symmetry and in order to resolve any indexing ambiguity you again need to know the correct symmetry so what we did is develop a system in uh, dials which will simultaneously resolve the crystal symmetry and indexing ambiguity, essentially by trying to um, align the lattices in reciprocal space so that the strong spots line up with strong spots and weaker spots line up with weaker ones uh, using the shape of the lattice as the uh, basis for doing that. Um, and what this generally means is actually you can take multiple data sets that have been integrated separately, put them into COSIM, and they pop out with the correct symmetry assigned and with the um, indexing ambiguity resolved so that they're all indexed in a way which is consistent. So when you scale them together, they all match up. So if I take that other data, I put them together and actually I get an overall um, slight improvement in the eye of a sigma. What this is saying is actually that the first data set was dominant. The second data set didn't actually add a lot because it was suffering from some radiation damage. But this is exactly the way that you can resolve the problem for a simple 
two two scan data set or merging two crystals. Now, obviously, <clears throat> if you're doing this kind of data processing, and particularly on the command line, you're having to keep track of a lot of different files. So uh, the input from each in the importing step, find spot step, also all creates multiple files. And if you want to process multiple data sets, um, it can be quite laborious to keep track of all the different um, files you've got. So you make a different directory for each data set and so forth. And that can actually get to be quite a lot of bookkeeping. Um, certainly if you're using an inter in, in, in interactive program like uh, HKL or XDS and so forth, if you wanted to process data from say 30 data sets, there's a fair chunk of bookkeeping to go on there. Um, what we did in dials, it actually made it so that when you import the data from the beginning, you can actually import multiple scans at once. And then it puts them all into one experiment file and says, yes, actually you're now processing three, 10, 50, 100 different data sets at once. So <clears throat> I called this ensemble processing. I'm sure there's other ways you could call it. Um, but basically what it means is you can import lots of data sets all at once. You can do spot finding on lots of data sets all at once. You can do indexing on a lot of data sets all at once. And all that's happening is as you move from one step to the next, you're carrying exactly the same files through the same workflow as you'd normally use um, and only handling maybe, you know, uh, two files coming in, two files coming out, rather than trying to keep track of dozens. Um, this <clears throat> really does make life a lot easier, particularly if you're, say, taking data from uh, small crystals on a mitogen mech or something along those lines. So what this basically means is we now have a multi-crystal processing spell, which means that you import a bunch of different data sets, you do the spot finding, and all it does is pick through them and keeps track of which spots come from which scans. Um, when you come to index, all we do is you add a joint index equal to false. So you're not trying to assign a single matrix to all of the scans. You're having a different matrix for each scan. Then the rest of the workflow is largely the same, except dial symmetry is now replaced with dial's cosine. But otherwise, actually exactly the same workflow works. And it normally does a pretty reasonable job. So, um, by way of an example, we've got a mesh here of small cubic insulin crystals. So um, these are uh, around 10 to 20 microns in size. They're in a mitogen mesh. And what we've done is actually collected from 32 of these, going click, 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 click go. Um, this was uh, 10 degrees from each crystal, so from minus 5 to plus 5 degrees in 0.1 degree steps. We're working at 100 frames a second, so that's one second per scan and about 5% transmission. I found that because a few of them I inadvertently roasted and found that, nope, you can't use much more than that 5%. So this is basically just going, the, the beamline is then going collect, 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 collect. And obviously each one of these uh, 10 degree data sets is a long way from being complete. But when you stitch them all together, you should have um, 320 degrees of data, so you may have something useful. So <clears throat> this is what I was using for the tutorial or for, for the uh, example case here. And so when I was doing the processing for this, what we do is import a load of the data. So we can import the data from 32 scans, uh, 3,200 images all at once. We do the spot finding and that just whizzes through doing 100 images at a time for the spot finding and then index it exactly this way. But what I did at that point is you pause and have a look at the output. Because one of the things that can be the case is if you're indexing a big, you know, 360 degree or 180 degree data set, it's normally pretty easy to index it and get the right result. Um, if you're indexing it, indexing 10 degree data sets, it's normally pretty robust, but occasionally there will be an odd one out or something like that where the indexing happens to have picked up a slightly different set of cell parameters to dis describe the same spots. So it's worth stopping at that moment, having a look at the output and maybe feeding that back in, which is what I'll show now. So the spot finding, what we've got here is what I would like to see where you've got roughly the same number of spots all the way through the scan. Uh, on, with dials at the very ends of the scan, you may find slightly more spots simply because these are the tails of the spots that would be on the images either side of the end of the scan. Um, but what you'd like to see is numbers being fairly constant. If they're all falling off, I can't tell which way around you are, uh, falling off like this, then probably you've overcooked it and you should adjust your strategy. So I imported 32 scans, so I've got 32 lots of this kind of information. When I do the indexing, uh, you get a lot of output because we've got 32 data sets to index. 
uh, but you can run a program called dials.report on the indexing output. And this will generate an HTML page, which I will show if we've got time at the end. And <clears throat> this gives you a lot of insight into what's going on with the unit cell, with the orientations, with how many spots are indexed and so on and so forth. Um, so when I look at the graphs here, what I see is the vast majority of them are sat in this kind of middle band, which looks like mostly indexed data sets. And then I've got a, an odd outlier on the total number of spots and another odd outlier on the number of indexed reflections. So they probably mean that something has gone a bit wrong. And then when I look at the unit cells that came out using the dial show program, what we see is that most of them came out with a, a roughly the same unit cell. But actually, there was one that picked up a slightly different unit, uh, set of cell parameters, which probably describes the lattice, but, but doesn't match with the other ones. So we can feed that information back in about the fact that we know actually from the indexing step now, the unit cell is about 67, 67, 67, 109, 109, 109. Feed that back in and continue working our way down the workflow. Um, so that's it's a good it's a good opportunity to pause and have a look at where it's got to because that's one of the stages where some questions may arise uh, so once we've done the we've gone through the refinement which works exactly the same as for um a single data set, data set and integration which again works exactly the same way because all, all we're doing is processing one data set at a time we can put the data into cosim and what we see with COSIM is actually, it's a very similar set of output to what we get uh, from dial symmetry. So on the left, you'll see the kind of symmetry operator table. And what this is showing is the correlation coefficient across different uh, data, different symmetry operations. Uh, we've got the symmetry operator on the right of that table. And you'll see that we've got all the three folds. We've got a, a few two folds, but we're missing all the four folds and a few other two folds. So the unit cell looks like it's cubic. Um, but there's no evidence in looking at how the data sets align in reciprocal space for that fourfold on the um, face of the cubes and the two folds that would be on the edges of the uh, cube. So what we've actually got is um, I23 or in proper symmetry terms, I, I M minus three or M three bar um, symmetry in the diffraction pattern. And this means that there is uh, some ambiguity remaining in the in the uh, indexing assignment. And so if you look on the right, what we find is actually roughly half of the data sets are indexed one way and the other half are indexed the other way. But <clears throat> the alignment in reciprocal space has resolved this. So what we can do is re-index half of the data sets by the um, spinning operator that takes you from one um, possible indexing solution to the other one and resolve all that and then put the data out in such a way as you can feed it straight into the scaling. So um, this then means that you can take all the data forwards and even though I'm processing uh, 31, 32 data sets here, I've not actually had to do much in the way of manual labor to actually get them lined up in reciprocal space. So we just pick up where we left off, dial scale, we take the symmetry data set out of COSIM and continue. So this is quite a kind of a manual process. And when you come to look at the scaling results and pick out which data sets you want to keep, which ones you don't, um, there can be a certain amount of manual work. So we've also automated this by um, developing a tool inside Zia2 called Multiplex. And what this is basically there to do is to go through all the kind of combinatorial approach to handling multi-crystal data that you if you're interactively using the dials tools would go through. Um, but the idea is to do this on your behalf. So you essentially say, look, I've gone through the tutorial. I've just done the uh, ensemble processing you described. And now I step off and go, well, here's my integrated data. Go and tell me what's the correct symmetry, um, <clears throat> which data sets merge well together, or do I have multiple clusters? You know, do I have different confirmations to consider and so forth here? I would like you to give me back all the clusters that are say 99% complete or some other fairly arbitrary uh, number, and it will go away and it will take the different data sets that have come out of the processing, merge them together using COSIM, and then look at whether you can actually uh, separate them out by things like the unit cell, by um, 
correlation coefficient clustering and so forth and so this is doing a lot of work on your behalf it can take a while particularly if you put in a few hundred data sets it can run on and on but if you're putting it in say 20 30 data sets it's surprisingly quick as in on my laptop it takes 15 minutes to run so <clears throat> the intensity clustering this is a fairly sort of standard technique what we're doing here is looking where you've got every data set and every other data set we look at the reflections that are in common and how correlated they are um, so there is probably some scope here to improve that, that correlation assessment, but on the whole, it's pretty useful. And the shape that you get here gives you a really good clue as to what's going on in your data set. So from the uh, chart we can see here, which is in the HTML page for Multiplex, you see we've got a big yellow blob. That's the major, like well agreeing part of the dendrogram. And then there's a red one that is represented on the outer edges as being uh, a data set that doesn't necessarily agree very well. And so we may want to exclude that in the analysis. When we look and see what Multiplex has done, we may find it's done that, done that for us. If you've got something where there's a big yellow box in one corner and a big yellow, or two, two yellow boxes on the diagonal and two orange or red boxes on the off diagonal, you may actually find that you've got two completely different crystal forms mixed into the same data sets. So we've used this to spot the difference between ligands being bound and ligands being absent and so forth. So there is quite a lot of information encoded in here. There are also some useful diagnostic tools. So things like the unit cell clustering and histograms of the unit cell parameters and so forth. Now, it's worth noting that with the unit cell parameters, because we're only indexing off 10 degrees of data, the um, accuracy of those cell parameters can be a bit iffy. Um, particularly if your crystal is, say, orthorhombic symmetry or lower, because you haven't really got a good handle on how well constrained they are. But when you bring all the data together, that should come out in the wash when we assign the um, global symmetry. So there is some unit cell clustering and stuff in here as well. This is principally there for you as a diagnostic for information because we use the correlation coefficient clustering for the um, isomorphism analysis. And the last thing that's shown here is what we call a stereographic projection. So this is uh, basically a presentation of, this is one of the three, of the um, orientation of the unit cell in the laboratory frame. So if you're taking data from multiple crystals, the ideal is that your crystals are randomly orientated so that when you measure data from one crystal and you measure it from the next, that little wedge of data is giving you new information. If you've got crystals that are plate-like, there's quite a possibility that actually that crystal morphology is following the crystal symmetry and actually the, there is a, a, a special direction pointing out of the plate. So if you're doing in situ data collection and your crystals are plate like, they are probably going to sit on the bottom of the plate all in roughly the same orientation. And what you'd see in the stereographic projection is either a big cluster of spots in the middle or a kind of donut of spots around the edge. So if you are doing some data collection, either in situ or in a similar uh, set of circumstances, it can be worth actually going through, processing some of the data as you're going and running multiplex to look for these kind of pathologies like preferred orientation. <clears throat> We've also found that this is a very um, likely outcome if you're collecting data uh, for electron diffraction as well that you've got these very tiny crystals on EM grids are actually prone to having preferred orientation. So it's something to be aware of um, and something to look for in the output from Multiplex. So the Multiplex uh, results as a whole are basically trying to give you essentially the, the best table one it can get from all of your data combined and then um, e each of the clusters that it's assigned. So when I was running this, I, I set a very, very high bar of I want 99 0.5% complete data set overall. So even though I put in 32 data sets, it actually needed 31 of those to get the complete data set. But by throwing away the red one that we saw on that graph, you, the um, inner shell R merge dropped by a couple of percent. The inner shell R PIM actually went up very slightly. So whether it's better or worse is a discussion topic. And maybe what you actually want to do is take the data out from one route and the other route and feed it into your downstream analysis map calculation and so forth um, so see which ones are actually better for you but what it will do is if you've got different um, 
two different morphologies in the same data set, it will actually separate those out quite nicely for you in a way that means that you're not having to go through and manually consider every combination. Okay, so um, I was going to talk about things that are new. Um, and the other thing that's, though we've done a lot of work on multi-crystal data processing, um, and I tried to summarize that here, uh, we've also been doing some work as a as a team on uh, supporting ser synchrotron serial crystallography experiments as well. Now, um, I thought about trying to fit this in here, and then I looked at the amount of time I had available of 30 to 50 minutes, and decided there's no way we could fit this in. So, um, what I would invite you to do is, if you are, are interested in doing synchrotron serial crystallography, if you just Google zia2.ssx, you will find the tools, and there are tutorials available online, and this is all bundled inside dials as well. Um, to be honest, I think this would be something that's maybe interesting as a webinar in its own right to get James Bilston Edmonds, who's the author of it, to give a tutorial about this as well. So, um, if you have any problems using dials, um, often it will be like I've been to a new beam line, uh, you know, somewhere which we, we're not familiar with. I've taken some data and dials didn't work. Uh, we have an issue page that you can uh, rest, register issues on on GitHub. Um, so uh, that's useful if you want to say, oh, I did this, I got a bug, or, or if you found a problem and you want to go and look to see if somebody else has reported it as well, it's a useful place to go. Um, be aware that if you report a problem to us, either through the web page here or by emailing dial support, that um, we may ask you for things like log files and so forth. Uh, normally, these, these are confidential, so that's no problem. But if you, you know, if you aren't able to share the data, there may be a certain amount of toing and froing to help you with the problem. Um, I'll be honest, the most common problem we have reported to dial support is I tried using dials and it didn't work. It turns out to be the version of dials that's included in CCP4 and installing a new version makes the problems go away because we fix things in the meantime. Okay, there are plenty of tutorials. So we've got tutorials linked from dials.github.io, which is our main web page. Um, I've also got a load of tutorials that I've written for various CCP4 workshops. Um, and what these do is these are not necessarily as well written, but explore some of the more interesting corners of what you can go and do with dials. And these are on my GitHub page here. I'm sure we can get the links circulated at the end. So with that, that's 37 minutes of my uh, 50 done. So I think I'm going to stop it there. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Well, thank you, Graham. That was a very interesting overview of what's new in dials. And yes, there we do have questions from the audience and, and for me, but I guess we should probably start off with the audience ones. So for, for the, when you were discussing the, the masking, the mask user configurable masking, is the thresholding for spot finding also something that's tunable or yes. user tunable? Uh, very much so. Um, so what we can do, oops, hang on, I'll just kill my screen share, sorry. Um, I clicked on my slides. If I go back to the image of your slide, there we go, and then reshare. So sorry about that. That was uh... Zoom. Zoom doesn't okay. make it easy sometimes. Well, it's fine. It's, 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 it's much easier. It's just me being incompetent. Um, so typos this, happen more when people watch. Um, this this was um, the dials image viewer. What it actually does is it exposes every parameter that you can fiddle with in the dial spot finding. So uh, if you want to adjust the thresholds and so forth, what you can actually do is explore how that works by loading up an image in the image viewer, switching it to threshold mode, which is looking at the image from the point of view of the spot finding, and then fiddling with the parameters. So if you only want to find like um, spots where the background is above a certain amount or below a certain amount or um, test out the different spot finding algorithms and so forth, you can fiddle with the parameters here. And that is, I mean, for most, certainly for photon counting detectors, you shouldn't need to be fiddling with anything. Um, if you're trying to process data from um, an electron microscope using a CCD detector or something like this, or one of their CMOS detectors, then you may find that it's worth fiddling with things. And also if you're processing data from like your own laboratory source, again, if it's something we've never encountered, the defaults inside dials may not work very well. So you can very much fiddle with the parameters and I would invite you to do so through the image viewer so you can actually immediately see the impact that has.
Thank you. And I, so an, another question came in when you were talking about the the new dot, the Zia2 multiplexing. So you you kind of hinted at this, but this this works for electron diffraction as well as it does X-ray diffraction. Yes, it works exactly the same way. Um, because for the stages that Dials is doing, all we really care about is the intensities of the spots, not what they're derived from. Um, so there's a few nuances with that. So uh, with electron diffraction, you have to be really careful that the you've got the direction of rotation correct. Because uh, with electron diffraction, the uh, wavelengths are very short, which means that the avowed sphere is very flat. So instead of having a nice curved avowed sphere, so you can tell which direction the rotation axis is, if you've got um, ED data, often it's like a pancake that you're rotating, and you are very much constrained on the rotation width that you can have, because it's normally up, say, minus 20 to plus 20 degrees on your tilt stage. Um, other than that, actually, provided that you've got the spot finding parameters correct, most of the steps in dials actually work pretty much the same. So yes, we've used the multiplex on data from uh, EVEC and so forth, doing electron diffraction as well. And it's, it's, it's worked quite well there. Great, thank you. I guess kind of transitioning to something that's slightly related, when you'd mentioned the, the library of information for like the metadata for, you know, where you've collected something, or I guess, I apologize, that was, that was a barely coherent question. I've got, I've got, I've got the gist. It, yeah. it, it, is that just a matter of editing parameters like the, the formats and the distances and the rotation directions, or is there is that more involved if you've got uh, a new, new source you need to bring in? So if you've got a new source you need to bring in, let's say for argument's sake that you've got um, a vertical goniometer on your source and you've got your detector on um, a two theta stage. To pick a random example, right? Um, so, I would choose even that way. That way. Yeah, be that way, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you can set all of these these special parameters in the dials import command line. So you can tell it it's got a vertical goniometer that's turning one way, or it's turning the other way, or that the detectors at a funny pitch, and all these kind of things. You can put all of that in the dials import command line which is what I would use for doing the commissioning work to make sure that I can actually process the data from my instrument. But that is not something that most of your users would want to do. So the idea is that we encode how you've written that into the image header into the format class. So then when your users, they basically take the raw, they take the data from your beamline, they take dials and it would just work because all the specialness for your beamline is already encoded in the format class for dials. Now, that works for the metadata, provided that your data are in standard format. So if your data are in, C in CBF format or in HDF5 with uh, like for Nexus format or something like that, then actually you can define most of this without any need to have a special format class. Um, if your data are in slightly special format, so a common one is uh, bringing data in in TIFF format from um, microscopes or something like that, then yeah. you may need to write your own or, you know, or make a work with us to write a format class that understands where the important numbers are written in those TIFF files so that we can go and find them and understand the data for you. Um, and if your data are in a completely special format, yeah, is, is completely special class, like um, you're storing the data in some completely unusual container format, I don't know, pick, pick a random format that I can't imagine right now, then dials wouldn't support it at all, but you can extend dials by uh, writing one of these format classes so that you can actually unpack the data and interpret it correctly. I guess kind of related to that, there there was a period of time where there was a debate about how to process images that were in the, the HDF5 format and mm -hmm. should they be converted to CBF with a standalone tool? Is that still an issue or should be? No. Is, okay. <laughs> no. Um, we, 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 we routinely process vast amounts of data at Diamond in HDF5 files, and it makes no difference at all. Um, I think the only, I mean, the, the, it was a problem originally because um, with XDS, the support was not there for arcane file formats like HDF5. It was very image-based. So when the first pixel array, or when the first IGAS came out, people were very used to CBF files, so they made CBF files from the IGAS. Um, they then extended XDS to have this ability to use uh, li libraries to read data. And then that's what people are using now. Um, so you've got like Durin plugins and so forth. Um, with dials, we've never 
try to do that we've always just said yeah you got data on disk it's in whatever format so if you go to an Excel, for example um uh, my colleagues working at berkeley on dials uh, routinely read data from things like xtc streams and this kind of nonsense where it's in a completely specialized bespoke format um but it doesn't matter because that's what's the data's in there somewhere so yeah. it uses that and it's not, not a question but more of a comment the the sp grid has a a data repository that has a relatively sure. large number of diffraction data sets and i can't think of a single time that we've reprocessed one of those with zia2 and dials and had a problem like oh we don't recognize you know yeah there's I mean, something wrong with the the, the the detector class detection yeah no, I mean, it, it the, basically the, never happens the, for the main for the main instruments people would use for structural biology it's normally fine um, the, the thing that catches us is we also use dials for chemical crystallography. So it will work. All the Everything I've talked about today will work just fine for small molecules as well. Um, and the small molecule instrument uh, kind of ecosystem is a bit more diverse. So if you've got data taken from like an ancient Brooker or, uh, you know, Rogaku or whatever, they write their data in completely different ways um, and support their tends to require a bit more work so yeah yeah like like you said if you, if there's a brand new binary format that you've never mm -hmm. seen before like yes it's going to take development work to get that sorted out exactly all right well i guess it seems like we've we've run through on questions so i guess one last call for those and if not then thank you very much for very 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 good talk <laughs> Thank you very much. I, well, thank you for hosting me. Enjoyable and educational for me. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much, everyone.